I want you to put your Bibles out in your lap or open your phone or your iPad, whatever you're using tonight. Let's go to Philippians, the book of Philippians, chapter 2. We're going to start there. We're going to go many places. Um, this is, this is going to be a different type of a word tonight. Obviously, we are in the conclusion of our seven-day fast tonight, holiness and humility. Say it with me tonight, holiness and humility. And it's been a very powerful week. It's been a very purposeful week. I'm so thankful for the videos, for, for our team, for the devotionals. Um, just want to thank our team, too. want to thank everyone that contributed this week that did a tremendous job. I want to say thank you to Josiah, our media director, and uh, for our, our app and all just the communication. It's really, it's really been tremendous. Aren't you thankful? I'm going to, yeah, go ahead. <clears throat> this will be a different kind of a word tonight, and I'm going to, I'm going to give I'm even going to give some key warnings tonight and maybe go back and grab this message later too. Re-listen to it. Take some good notes tonight. But let's listen for the Spirit of God to speak to us. Amen. And as I'm doing, you know, to be a faithful messenger, I stand here listening to the Spirit of God to speak to me. And I'm in communion with the Holy Spirit while I'm communing with you. And I believe God has something mighty for us tonight. And I, I am going to be speaking for the next few minutes on the pursuit of humility, but there is so much more that, that the Lord has, has added for this message tonight, far more. And so I'm going to just obey the Lord, see how this begins to unfold. Are you ready for it? Father, we just thank you again for the power of your presence, the power of your word and may your word unfold to us tonight. May your word wash over us tonight, Lord. Let your word wash over us. Let your word refresh. Let your word strengthen and feed your sons and your daughters, Lord. I thank you that you're calling us up to a higher place and a higher level of your glory this year of 2024. And I thank you that everything is going to change. I thank you that you are strengthening the ecclesia even now. <sighs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Wow. Amen. Amen. I want to look at the book of Philippians just as an opening scripture tonight that is so rich. And honestly, we, I, I could spend the whole night on it. But it's really our, our opening. It's, it's so rich. It's so thick. And I could spend the entire night on it. But, I, but I've, got to, I've got to gain some ground tonight. I, I'm going to try to take for the next 30 minutes. How many of you have faith for that? <laughs> it's not a stretch. <laughs> I'm going to begin in verse 1. I'm reading out of the Passion Translation tonight. Look how much encouragement you have found in your relationship with the Anointed One. And you are filled to overflowing with his comforting love. You have experienced a deepening friendship with the Holy Spirit and have felt his tender affection and mercy. And so I'm asking you, my friends, that you be joined together in perfect unity with one heart, one passion, and united in one love. Walk together with one harmonious purpose, and you will fill my heart with unbounded joy. Be free of pride-filled opinions, for they will only harm your cherished unity. Don't allow self-promotion to hide in your heart, but in authentic humility, put others first and view others it's more important than yourselves. We just pause and say amen to all this. Amen. amen. Abandon every display of selfishness. Possess a greater concern for what matters to others instead of your own interest. And consider the example that Jesus, the anointed one, 
has set before us and let his mindset become your motivation. He existed in the form of God, yet he gave no thought to seizing equality with God as his supreme prize. Instead, he emptied himself of his outward glory by reducing himself to the form of a lowly servant. He became human. He humbled himself and became vulnerable, choosing to be revealed as a man and was obedient. He was the perfect example, even in his death, a criminal's death, by crucifixion. That's brutal. He has now been given the greatest of all names. Hallelujah. He has been given the greatest of all names. The authority of the name of Jesus causes every knee to bow in reverence. Everything and everyone will one day submit to this name in the heavenly realm, the earthly realm, and in the demonic realm. Whew, that's going to be awesome. I'm going to pause there. Man, there's, there's coming a day, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to look upon, Scripture even says, we're going to look upon him who tormented the nations. We're going to be in utterly disgust over him, and we're going to be in awe of him and say, is this the one? Is this the one? that brought such schisms and deception to the nations. And we're going to watch him be cast into the lake of fire. Hallelujah. That day is coming. Folks, that day is very real. That day is very real. I look forward to that day. And I'm going to stand there and applaud and say victory to the Lord. Get rid of him. Drop kick him. Send him out. Do it. Every tongue will proclaim. <laughs> that was an inside joke to some of you in the church. In every language, Jesus Christ is Lord Yahweh. Let's say it tonight. Jesus Christ is Lord Yahweh. Bringing glory and honor to God his Father. Hallelujah. Wow. Jesus is the ultimate perfection of humility. Jesus is the ultimate perfection perfection of humility. And for us, for you and I, humility in its truest form, it means that we are actually reflecting the beauty of Jesus. I spoke a little bit during our fast about A.W. Tozer just reminding us that A.W. Tozer, when he was the one that wrote, he said, he said, the only sin that Jesus would ever know and has ever known is my sin, your sin. But the only righteousness that you and I will ever know is his righteousness. And because we have been made clean, because we have been made holy through the blood of Jesus, we have been made holy through the blood of Jesus. We're not trying to obtain holiness through works. Are you hearing me? We're not trying to obtain holiness through works. Though God has called us to be set apart and holy unto him, and we bear the our own responsibility in the place of the covenant that Jesus has given to us under his blood. That holiness comes from his blood alone and from his righteousness. And Jesus sees us through that blood and through his righteousness. And isn't that beautiful? How many of you desire for people to see Jesus in you? I'm telling you what, that's, that's the cry of my heart. I want people to see the Lord Jesus in me. If they see Brian, they're not ultimately going to, you know, they're, gonna, they're not going to be really excited, you know. <laughs> but if they see the Lord in me, it'll change their life. If they, feel, if they feel the Lord in my countenance and in my presence, if they feel the Lord when I place my hand upon them, if they hear the Lord's voice through my voice, and when his manifest presence lands upon them, they will know there is a God. There is a living God. That is Jesus. I want people to see the Lord in me. I want the, pe I want the people of this city and this region to see the Lord through victory, a church of his presence. Can I get an amen? amen. True humility and genuine humility in the life of every believer, it is possible. That's good, isn't it? It's possible because Christ lives in us and we are in him. And in Romans chapter 8, it tells us that we are the ones who are being conformed into the very image of God. 
That is your destiny. That is my destiny. That is your destiny, that is my destiny, to be conformed into the very image of Christ Jesus. And that's what the Holy Spirit is doing within us right now. We're in a work and a process of the Holy Ghost making us to look just like the Lord. So in this passage I've just read, we see the picture of humility through Jesus so powerfully. And what I want to highlight tonight is it, it also demonstrates that there's a link with our relationship not only to God but to one another. And I don't want you to miss that. And I'm going to pause and say it again. What we just read in Philippians 2, it talks about, hear this tonight. Stay with me and go the distance tonight. We are not only connected to God, we are connected to one another. We have to be very, very careful how we handle one another in the body, in the family of God. That we're not only sensitive to the Holy Spirit, but that we're sensitive to one another and how we cherish our unity amongst the family of God. Can I get an amen? In the next few minutes, I want to go there. Some of, this is, some of this is so much part of the devotion that was laid out for us, but there's so much more. And I want to dig deep tonight because I feel, like, I feel like the Lord is bringing some very strong warnings to the church right now. When I say the church, I'm not just talking about victory, a church of His presence in Sarasota. I'm talking about warnings that He is speaking globally to the church, and we who have an ear, Jesus said, he who has an ear, what did he say? And then he also said, if you have an ear to hear, do not harden your heart. That's very key. That's very key. That's why we are pursuing humility, that we honor the Lord with our lives, and then we serve and love and treat one another properly in the kingdom. And there's a lot of messes in the church. There's a lot of messes in the kingdom that are so unnecessary. And that's why we're fasting. And that's why we're seeking God and praying and saying, God, conform us into your image and your likeness so that I love like you. I speak like you. I respond like you, Lord. Amen. I said in the devotional, it, it's crazy. I mean, we live in a generation that's it's, it's wildly obsessed with itself. I mean, all you have to do is just, just kind of think about social media. Yeah, it's, it's, it has a life of its own. It, it's a life of selfies. <laughs> it's, a, it's a life of self-gratification. It's crazy. But what happens is when you begin to pursue true humility, what happens is, is you, you actually enter in to a process of deconstruction of yourself. If, you're, if we're going to pursue the Lord and pursue His face and pursue His holiness and pursue to get low and surrendered with genuine, authentic humility before the Lord, we're going to enter into a process of deconstruction where we're not so pre preoccupied with ourselves. How many of you know that's hard to do? We've got five honest people in the church tonight. It's very hard not to be preoccupied with yourself or what you're going through. I learned this. I, I learned it through the battle of, of 29 years of ministry with Brent, of working with people. My, my, my ministry is all kinds of stuff. It's not just behind this. It's people. It's being with people. It's going through the trenches with people. It's fighting for people. Notice how I said that. It's not fighting with people. It's fighting for people. I'm not, into, I'm not into drama. I'm not into fighting with people. I'm into fighting for people. I'm into fighting for victories for people. But I'm telling you what. <laughs> it is so easy to be so preoccupied with our own lives and then live so small. I don't want to live small. Are you with me tonight? So let's start with these words, John 3.30. Let's start with these words, powerful words. Let's start with the words from John the Baptist, John 3.30. I'm reading it out of the NIV translation tonight. He says, he must increase and I must decrease. He says it so plainly here, NIV, ready? He says, he must become greater. I must become less. Whoa. 
<laughs> he must become greater. I must become less. When's the last time you heard someone talking about that kind of a vision for their life? When's the last time you heard someone talking about that kind of vision for their life? The Lord must become greater and I must become less. Because we all know everybody's in the rat race and they're climbing the ladder and it's dog eat dog in the world, in the spirit of the world, in the spirit of the sage, that they're doing anything they can to climb on the backs of anybody because they're going to become greater. Don't tell me that's not going on. And even in the church world, it goes on. So it's interesting. I'm going to take it a step further tonight. Jesus said in Luke 7, put it in your notes, Luke, Luke 7 and verse 28, <clears throat> he said of his cousin John that he was the greatest human being in all, of all of history. That's, uh, that's a mouthful. He's the greatest human being in all of history. Jesus said among those born of women, there is no one greater than John. Wow. Among those born of women. And isn't that good to note the distinction he, he didn't say those that are born of men, too. I mean, Jesus just made it very clear uh, that you got to be born of a woman. Uh, you can't be born uh, from a man. I don't care what they try to say. And, and the de strong delusion that they're trying to sell us in 2024, women have babies. Come on, women. Can I get an amen? Come on, men. Let's give it up for the women. <laughs> this is awesome. Among those born of women, there's no one greater than John. And I believe, which I'm going to give some distinction to t tonight, I believe that Jesus highlighted this about John's life because John had a pure pursuit of humility. And I want you to think about a few things. Here's what I could do tonight. I could tell you about the many attributes of John the baptizer's ministry and of his life. I could talk to you tonight about John's encounter. He was out leading the masses unto repentance to the Lord. The masses, the masses were flowing out to John the Baptist. We could highlight his ministry. We could highlight his consecration. We could highlight him being set apart, how powerful he was, how zeal overtook John the Baptist. Zeal for the house of Lord. Zeal for his nation. Zeal for his people. Zeal for holiness. And yet in John chapter 3 and verse 34, this is what he says. He says, I have seen and I have testified that this is the Son of God. Oh, I love that. I love that. John the Baptist had so much zeal just like Jesus did. He had great passion. He had great authority. He had great discernment. He had great passion. John was not somebody who was, he was not willing to back down from calling sin, sin. John was not one that was going to be, as Jesus, Jesus described, he's not one that's blown by the wind. You ain't going out to see somebody who's blowing here and blowing there. He's not wishy-washy. He's not placating for anyone. You're, when you go out to John, you're not going to find somebody who's just going along to get along. You're going to hear a pure word, a fire word, and he's going to call you to repentance, and he's going to call you up out of your sin and into the waters of repentance. And John called his nation, he called his people to holiness. He even called out civil authorities. He made no apologies for calling out civil authorities. Put it in your notes tonight. I don't want to go to the depths of this, but it's in Mark 6, verses 14 through 29. Take time to read it this week. Grab it in your devotional time. Because John the Baptist, he calls out Herod for taking and marrying his brother Philip's wife, Herodias. And it also cost John the Baptist imprisonment, and it literally cost him his head. Many of us know the story how Herodias' daughter came in dancing before Herod. She does this dance. We don't want to go into the details of that, but something was released in that room. It was demonic. It was vile. It was an evil spirit that said, I want to eliminate the spirit of Elijah. 
He says he gets, he gets intoxicated with it. He gets fantasized, romanticized, sexualized, caught up in it. He says, I'll give you anything you want up to the half of my kingdom. And she says, I want the head of John the Baptist. And he is, he is struck to the core. Herod is struck to the core and going, oh, my gosh. And then, and then starts weighing out and measuring out all those seated around him. They're, they're, he, was, he was so wrapped in the fear of man. He was struck to the core, and he said, okay, I'm willing to do this. But see, John the Baptist, his zeal and his passion for the house of God literally cost him his life. But then I think of Jesus, and I want you to look at John 2 tonight. Jesus' zeal for the house of God. This is a powerful scripture. I I remember saying on our our first family trip, of course, I I went by myself um, on our my first trip with another team to Israel. But on our second trip, we were able to take um, my wife and Josiah, Victoria, and uh, Bren's mom and dad. And speaking of Bren's mom and dad, Bren's mom and dad is in the house tonight all the way from Ohio. It's so wonderful to have them tonight. Love you, Francis. Love you, Pat. I asked Josiah, I said, Josiah, what do you, what, son, what do you want to do when you get to Israel? How old was he, honey, on that first trip? How old? Was he 18? I said, son, how, what do you, uh, we were all in the car together, remember, and I said, son, what do you want to do when you get to Israel? He said, I want to make a whip and turn over the tables. <laughs> That's my boy. That's my boy. That's my boy. That's my man. I, actually, I was just so shocked by his answer because it just, it just didn't even fit who I had known him to be. I want to look at this scripture tonight. This is powerful. Now, the Passover of the Jews was at hand. Jesus went up to Jerusalem, and he found the temple of those who sold oxen and sheep and doves and the money changers doing business. And when he had made a whip of cords, whip with a P, a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen and poured out the changers' money. Notice how it says that. And poured out the changers' money and overturned the tables. And I don't want you to miss this. He touched the money. He touched the money, which they were worshiping instead of God. you got to grab a hold of that. Jesus overturned and poured out their money and then overturned the tables. They were worshiping the money rather than worshiping the holiness of God, and it's going on in 2024 in the church in this hour, and you better believe the fire of the Holy Ghost is going to purify it all. (laughs) Hallelujah. And he said to those who sold doves, he says, take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of merchandise. And then his disciples remembered this, zeal for his house has eaten him up. Well, that's powerful. Zeal for his house has eaten him up. Measure yourself tonight. Measure your zeal for the house of God. Measure yourself tonight. Measure your zeal and your passion for the people of God. For your brothers, for your sisters, for your leadership, for the house of God, for the dream of God, for the vision of God. Measure yourself. See if you might be lacking some zeal tonight. I say, God, set us on fire. So the Jews answered and said to him, what sign do you show us since you do these things? And Jesus said to him, destroy this temple. And in three days, I'm going to raise it up. Isn't Jesus awesome? He's awesome. They said, oh, it's taken 46. It's taken 46. Jesus, you're out of your mind. You've gone mad. You're ludicrous. You're nuts. What's up with you? It's taken 46 years to build this. You're saying you're going to raise it up in three days. He was speaking of the temple of his body. Therefore, when he had been risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said to them this to them, and they believed the scriptures and the word which Jesus had said. Victory tonight to you, to you in this room, to those online, 
to those that are going to listen to this in a few weeks from now or watch it a few weeks from now, hear the word of the Lord tonight. The Lord is going to keep touching, exposing, and overturning whatever it is that people are worshiping instead of Him. The Lord's going to overturn some more tables in 2024. The Lord's going to overturn places where people have settled in lifeless religion. The Lord's going <clears> to... <throat> He's going to overturn places where people have run away in fear and cowardice. He's going to overturn hidden places where people have retreated from so that they don't have to be forced out into the open to be salt and light to this culture. God's going to overturn it. God's going to overturn places where people have been negligent. It's the fear of the Lord. God's going to overturn places where people have been willfully sinning and ignoring the clear warnings of the Holy Spirit. The Lord's going to overturn it. Now, there is some clear division that's coming to the body of Christ at large this year, but it is necessary. And it's necessary because what I'm talking about, and you need to stay with me, we're far from done. What I'm talking about is God is going to do it because it bears upon truth and righteousness. That's what it's about. Are you still here tonight? It is about those who have been ignoring the clear word of the Lord. It's necessary and the Lord has to do this. There are... I don't have any joy in saying this. There are a lot of sloppy, carnal Christians living foolishly right now. And those foolish, carnal, sloppy Christians are the ones that you are finding attacking those who desire to be vessels of honor and vessels of glory And are separating themselves to be holy unto the Lord. We're not talking about a self-righteousness, ladies and gentlemen. We're talking about the righteousness of Christ. And I'm taking my time tonight to give a warning and wisdom tonight. That we protect the family of God. We have to act responsibly. Please take that personal. Please take that personal. You have to protect the unity that's in the family of God. You have to... Take responsibility. Act responsibly, protecting the unity. Ephesians 4, verses 3 through 6. Read it with me. Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were being called in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all, And in you all. I love how that's worded. Endeavor to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond. That's a powerful word. The bond of peace. Can we go on? Colossians chapter 3. Put it in your notes tonight. Colossians chapter 3 verses 14 and 15. It says above all. Somebody say above all. Say it again. Come on church. Talk. Come on. Above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection, and let the peace of God rule in your hearts to which you were called in one body, and be thankful, and be thankful. Look at those words, above all these things, put on love. Above prophecy, above gifts. Above tongues, above interpretation of tongues, above dreams and visions, put on love. Galatians 5, 6, faith works by love. Say it with me tonight. Faith works by love. Say it with me. Faith works by love. So he's saying above all, above all, above all, put on love. 
Guard the cherished unity amongst the body. Fight for one another. Treat one another right. Esteem others higher and greater above yourselves. Humble yourselves unto one another. Why? Because I want to protect the cherished bond of love and the bond of peace and the unity that we are sharing. We don't want to let anything break us apart. And we have to behave ourselves very maturely that we don't allow anything to break us apart. And this is mature stuff. This isn't for immature Christians. This is for for those that are growing and going on and leaving the milk and going into the meat. This is serious stuff. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13 is a very familiar scripture, but I want to highlight it tonight. And though I speak with the tongue of men and of angels, but I have not love, I have become a sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy, and I understand all mysteries and all knowledge, so that I have all faith. Wow, think of that. So that I could remove mountains, but I, I don't have love. I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, though I give my body to be burned... And I have not love. It profits me nothing. Look at verse 2 again. If I have not love, I am nothing. So back to this pursuit of humility. I believe, how many of you believe what I'm talking to you tonight is actually vitally important? Can I see your hand? Oh, it is. It's time for us to be very watchful and alert about this very thing. We guard our cherished unity and we watch over one another and we love one another maturely and properly. We go the distance with one another. We be gracious with one another. We we are long-suffering with one another. It's important, isn't it? Finally, Matthew chapter 24 and verse 12, as I've alluded to so many times, Jesus said, Because of wickedness or lawlessness that's going to abound, the love of many will grow cold. We've really got to watch out for that, don't we? It's it's a high-level warning. It's a high-level warning. What we're seeing, you know, vomited out all over this generation, it, it can affect you. And we're being affected, and that's why we're hitting our knees and we're hitting fasting and we're hitting prayer and we're hitting the altars and we're saying, God, don't want that to have any effect on me. I want my love to keep burning. I want my love to keep burning. And you know what? Who's our high priest? The Lord's going to keep us burning. Amen. He's our high priest. He's going to keep that fire burning that we were singing about tonight. Sandra, I'm so glad you led us in that tonight. It was awesome. I want you to go to John 3 for the next couple minutes. John 3, and I'm about to close. John 3, we're going to begin to read in verse 25. This is interesting. John has... John has some of his own uh, ministry leadership acting very proud around him. This is interesting. And and what John does is he lovingly and humbly, he reveals to them, John the Baptist, he reveals to them a mindset that produces authentic humility. And let's begin to read in verse 25. Then there arose a dispute between some of John's disciples and the Jews about purification. And they came to John. And they said to him, Rabbi, he who was with you beyond the Jordan and to whom you have testified, behold, he is baptizing and all are coming to him. Now, who are they talking about? They're talking about Jesus. They're, they're, They're leaving us, man, and they're going after him. Now, watch this response. John answers and said, a man can receive nothing unless it is given to him from heaven. You yourselves, you bear witness of me that I said, I'm not the Christ, but I have been set before him. He who has the bride is the bridegroom. But the friend of the bridegroom who stands, he's talking about himself, and hears him, he rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. And therefore, this joy of mine, it is fulfilled. He must increase, but I must decrease. Write it down tonight. Humility gives birth to contentment, not entitlement. The proud are always those who, they carry this sense of entitlement as if they're owed something. 
And this shows up because they, they, they contend for stuff or they demand stuff or their, their feelings get hurt because they're not getting what they thought that they deserved. That, that's, that's living in a place of pride. That's, it's, that's hard, isn't it? Humility gives birth to contentment. It doesn't give birth to entitlement. Once you, once you start realizing, man, it, this is humbling. It's humbling to say. Once we, once we identify with this revelation that you and I literally deserve eternal hell, you will see everything else as a gift of, in, in your life. When you realize what we've been delivered from and who we've been set apart unto, you start viewing everything in your life as a gift of God. This is a gift of God. This very night, standing here looking at you, you looking at me, this very night, this very night is a gift of God. Your life is a gift of God. The people we're seated to right next to us tonight, this is a gift of God. We're under the hearing of the word. We're in a free nation where we can come and have religious freedom and liberties to come and worship our God. We can stay here till midnight. We can light a fire out there tonight and keep it going. Go ahead and give God praise. It's a gift. This is a gift. This worship was a gift. This worship was a gift unto the king. I love it. I want to see everything in my life as a gift of God. And I, I don't want to belabor the point too much. I, and I, and I've, I've spoken about it sometimes. I, I can remember you and I in, in El Salvador in the jungle and those pastors wanting us to lay on their bed, not for us to sleep on the, on the dirt floors in the church filled with bats and tarantulas, for real, and we're sleeping under our mosquito nets, and those pastors wanted us to sleep on, on they were just, um, they, they looked like uh, shipping pallets. That's what they were. They were shipping pallets. There was four of them, and they, they laid it with hay, there was hay on top of these shipping pallets and a blanket for us. They begged me and Bren to sleep in their bed. It was so humbling. That's never left me. Bren and I always say, we thank God for our bed. And our, I'm telling you, we thank God for our bed. And actually, in revival, somebody built us. We went, we went to... Uh, a custom mattress company because the guy got so whacked in revival. Him and his wife, they wanted to royally bless me and Brent. We got to pick out the mattress. We got to pick out our own custom springs. And our bed is epic. Thank God we're sleeping back in it finally <laughs> after moving several times. And Anyway, long story. Guys, just, just see everything as a gift. I see everything as a gift. See your health as a gift. Your life as a gift. Hallelujah. See, coming off this fast tomorrow, eating as a gift. <laughs> Woo! I, I want to eat. Hallelujah, I want to eat. So with people leaving jo J John's ministry and joining Jesus' ministry, look what John says, this joy of mine, it's complete. That's amazing. John is happier to see Jesus succeed than his own success. John is more happy to see Jesus succeed than his own success that is humility. He says, oh, born among women, John ranks them all. Isn't that powerful? This is a revelation of the kingdom of God right here. It's wrapped in this message so powerfully. And if we want to look back at, at Philippians 2 for just a moment, when the apostle Paul started, he said, be free of pride-filled opinions. They're going to harm your cherished unity. Don't allow self-promotion to hide in your heart. But in authentic humility, put others first. View others more important than yourself. Abandon every display of selfishness. Possess a greater concern for what matters to others instead of your own interest. Consider the example of Jesus, the anointed one. And let this mindset become your motivation. What am I saying? Put others first. View others more important. John gets right to the heart of the matter of humility. And this is, this is what it is. Write it down. Humility produces decreasing, not increasing. Really? That's true. Humility produces decreasing, not increasing. 
And our culture, you know, I, we've talked about before. I mean, everybody's climbing over everybody right now. John the Baptist was just the opposite. He wasn't climbing over anybody. He was out on his mission, his assignment, being faithful, and said, I'm not going to turn my back on my mission. So Jesus brings it to the forefront. He says, he must become greater. I must become less. Proverbs 20, 22 and verse 4. Put it in your notes tonight. Proverbs 22 and verse 4. Humility is the fear of the Lord. Its wages are rich. Riches and honor and life. Say that tonight. Humility is the fear of the Lord. Humility is the fear of the Lord. Humility is the fear of the Lord. When I talk about you, you, I want to be able to say, Kevin is humble because he fears the Lord. I can see the fear of the Lord in his life. I want you to be able to say that to me as your friend or as your leader or as your shepherd or whatever I am to you, that you would say, Brian really is humble because he fears the Lord. That's where it's at. Hallelujah. The fear of the Lord always returns us to reverential worship. It's why we do what we do here, folks. Aren't you glad you're not in the church? It gives you 15 minutes of worship. Runs you out the door, gets the announcements done, 20-minute little ditty message, and you're out. Get the butts in the seats, get those offering buckets flowing, and we're out. Peace out. I don't want any part of that. The prophet Micah, Micah 6, verse 8. I love this. He says that we're to act justly. What does that mean? It means that we're to do what is right. Guys, let's do what's right. Let's keep doing what is right, even when it's hard. When we were raising our son and daughter, who are now young adults, we would always say, you got to do hard things. You got to do hard things. You got to learn what it is to break through hard things and get over yourself. We got to keep doing what is right. So we've got to act justly. We've got to love mercy. We've got to walk humbly with our God. And this is where the pursuit of holiness and humility comes all together. And when it comes together, what happens is, is we begin to manifest the very nature and character of Jesus. And when it all comes down to it, after all of these words that I've been releasing up here from this stage, the word is, you are called and commissioned to look just like Jesus. Let's hunger this year to look just like the Lord. Let's love. And let me tell you, listen, love is not weak. Love is very fierce and robust and strong. I'm not talking about some wussy, little fragile love. I'm talking about, I'm talking about practicing strong love with one another. Speaking into one, one another's lives. Allowing others. Listen, when you're humble, you allow others to speak into your life. There's, there, there's so many times, Brent and I will go in the office, we'll close the door, it's within five minutes I will ask somebody, do you want me to speak into your life or is, just, is this just a monologue? You're just wanting to be heard. You've asked for my time and you just want to be heard. You just want to be understood. But actually, do you want advice? And you know what I found? There's a lot of people that don't want advice. They just want to be heard. They don't want counsel. They want to be heard. Practicing humility, we've got to esteem and put one another's above ourselves. It's hard. Cody said it in his devotional. I remember when he said this. He said, humbling yourselves, man, it's hard. I was like, there you go. Thanks for calling it out, being honest. It is hard. Because you had to step back and you got to take a breath and go, yeah, what is the king asking of me? What is the king saying to me? How am, I, how am I to manifest the king? 
How am I to honor the king the way I treat others here? And this is the way of the kingdom of God, isn't it? This is the way of the kingdom. So, every one of you are beautiful. I love this church. I love when you walk in the room. I love when you walk in the prayer room. I love when you walk into our house. I love when you walk into this house. I love this church. I love what God is building. I love what God is building. And you need to know something. Brent and I cherish it. We cherish this. And we talk about y'all all all the time. I just went Kentucky. (laughs) We talk about y'all all all the time. It's a good thing. Because when we talk about you, we say they're wonderful people. They're amazing people. And you know what I also say? I see Jesus in them. They're growing. They're growing in God. They're growing in God. I see Jesus in them. And we're going to grow as the ecclesia exponentially this year. We're going to grow in great authority and power. And God's going to give to us so much more, so much more, if we do it right. If we do it right. And let's just say, we're going to do it right. Come on, say it. I'm going to do it right. Come on, say it. I'm going to do it right, and I'm going to do it right with others. Take a hand right now. Father, thank you for this gathering. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your word that that cuts between the soul and the spirit, the bone and the marrow. Lord, that that actually discerns the very intents of our heart. God, may we walk worthy. God, may we walk worthy. May we walk holy. May we walk circumspectively. May, May we walk humble. I know you're praying that with me right now. Holiness, humility. Holiness, humility. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Well, we just exalt the Lord tonight, amen. He's the ultimate example. He's the ultimate example. We want to look like our king, don't we? We want to look like our king. Yeah, thanks, Shane. You know, I, <clears throat> are we still on live stream back there? We're still, yeah, we're still. <laughs> a lot of you, a lot of you wrote me about the torch this week. Actually, a lot of people, not just victory, a lot of people. And I said that we need the courage in this hour to be disliked. We need the courage in this hour to be disliked. And here's what I mean by that. We don't need to be celebrated by the world. Notice how I said the world. You want to celebrate one another in the household of faith. You want to celebrate this family. Fight for one another. Don't fight with one another. Fight for each other. But when it comes to the world, whatever it is on the inside of us, take this personal tonight. I'm telling you what, I'm measuring this out in my own life so strong right now, 29 years deep in ministry. We have to destroy whatever it is within us that wants to be celebrated by this world. The only way that it gets really burned out of us is the pursuit that which we are in. And it comes by prayer and fasting. Prayer and fasting. Prayer and fasting. You don't want to be celebrated by the world. You want to be known by the King of glory. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We're going to open the altars tonight. Those of you that are part of our prayer team, I want you to just prepare yourself. Let's see what God wants to do. I went I went a little longer than 30 minutes. Went 47. Y'all all right? I know you are because we've gone till 10 o'clock and you all have stayed. But I want our prayer team to prepare themselves. We're going to open the altars tonight. We want to minister to you. We want to pray for you. How many of you know Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever? He is the healer. He is the healer. He's the redeemer. 
He's the restorer. And we speak His healing word over your lives tonight. Hallelujah. Boy, this has been a blessed night. I, I, I'm just amazed. I, I'm, I'm exhausted. This has been a marathon week. This is night seven of our family. I'm telling you, Bren, nobody knows better. I, I am so beyond exhausted. But God has carried me tonight. I gave him everything I had in worship and then joined up with the worship team. They gave it everything that they've got. I mean, you, you all went the distance. <laughs> you all went the distance. And, and, and I know you're tired. <laughs> I can see it on a lot of you. And I know you're feeling it. I'm so proud of you. Man, just thanks for going the distance and just keeping it in the journey. Just... Thank you for running with us. You know what we're doing is, is not real popular. <laughs> so I'm just so thankful. I'm just so proud of all of you. I love you. Bless you. I want our prayer team to come. And if you need prayer tonight, we want to minister to you. We want to love you. Grab that breath mint so we don't kill anybody with fasting breath. Let's stand together tonight. Father, Father, thank you for victory a church of your presence. Thank you for this wonderful family of God. I speak the Lord's blessing over you. The Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face shine upon you. Be gracious to you. And the Lord turn his face towards you. Lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace give you peace. Come on, let's all of us, let's lift our hands to the Lord tonight. Let's bask in that peace right now. Just know the Lord is smiling over you tonight. His blessing is on you. His favor is on you. You're a chosen vessel. Hallelujah. Let's sing that again, Cody. Life to you, I'm your temple. Fill me with fire, a living sacrifice on your altar. You keep me burning. I'll pledge my life to you i'm your temple fill me with fire a living sacrifice on your altar you keep me burning i'll pledge my life and i'll pledge my life to I'm your temple, fill me with fire, a living sacrifice on your altar, you keep me burning, I'll pledge my life, I'll pledge my life to you, I'm your the flame of love. That's it. That's where to land. With the flame of love. If I have not love, I am nothing. If I have not love, I am nothing. Lord, let the flame of your love be set on fire. Set on fire in us. In Jesus' name. The altars are open tonight, guys. The altars are open. If you need prayer tonight, Come. We love you. 
Good night, Victory.